Okay, chemical reactions. Um, chemical reactions are chemical changes. In a chemical reaction, we have one or more substances that is being converted into different substances. The original substances are destroyed, new substances are formed. Remember that we are rearranging atoms, but the atoms themselves are not created or destroyed. So it's like taking apart something made out of Legos and just putting it together again in a different way. We use chemical equations as a shorthand to describe the chemical reaction. In some ways, they are like math equations. But instead of an equal sign, we have an arrow. So we have the reactants and then an arrow pointing to the products. The reactants are, are generally, well, the reactants are on the left side and the products are on the right side. And the sorts of information that we find in chemical equations, we'll get the formulas of the reactants and products, their chemical formulas. We'll often have the states, gas, liquid, solid, aqueous. We'll get the relative numbers of molecules of each reactant and product. And then from that information, we can figure out the masses of reactants that are used and the masses of products that are formed. And that's where it becomes practical. Um, we have symbols that we use to indicate the states of reactants and products. They're pretty easy to understand. G for gas, L for liquid, S for solid. AQ stands for aqueous. That means it's dissolved in water. It's a homogeneous solution of whatever that substance is in water. Let's talk about the combustion of methane. Methane is the main gas in natural gas which reminds me of something that happened on Friday afternoon. My husband and I got home from work, and the 11-year-old, almost 12, and the 8-year-old were home, and they were watching TV in the living room. And I opened the door, and I was just overwhelmed by this stench. It was just so horrible. I mean, I've come home to the smell of cat urine or something before, or burnt popcorn, but this was bad. I'm like, what the heck is that? And it took us about 30 seconds to realize it was gas. They had bumped the knob on the range when they were making popcorn in the microwave above it, and one of the gas burners was on and unlit. And it had been probably running like that for a couple hours. And they apparently couldn't smell it. I don't know. We need to get their noses checked. Um, thankfully, the house did not blow up. But I mean, it could have been really horrible. So here we are talking about methane. By the way, methane has no odor. The smell that you smell when the gas is turned on, the smell that we smell when the gas jets here are turned on, is a compound that is added to the gas to give it a smell. Because if there had been no odor from that gas in my house, I would have had no clue until the next time I went to use the stove that there was gas pouring into the house. And so it's a safety feature. It smells really bad. What happens when gas burns? It combusts, it reacts with oxygen, and produces carbon dioxide and water. You might say, well, I didn't ever see any water being formed on the gas stove. That's because it's hot. And so it makes water in the gas state. So here is a chemical equation describing the combustion of methane. Here's methane, CH4. Um, here's oxygen. Oxygen is one of those seven diatomic elements, and they react to form carbon dioxide and water. But if we look at this, we see that there's a problem. Um, on the left side of this equation, there are two oxygen atoms. On the right side of the equation, there are three oxygen atoms. Can we have a chemical reaction in which we create an oxygen atom. No, we can't. It's also messed up when we look at the hydrogens. Over here on the left, there's four hydrogen atoms. And over here on the right, there's only two hydrogen atoms. And you might be creative and say, well, maybe, maybe those two missing hydrogen atoms turned into an oxygen atom. No, no, it can't happen. Law of conservation of mass says, what you start with is what you end up with. That is in terms of mass. It's also in terms of individual atoms. So this is not going to work. Well, it's not that the 
actual chemical reaction is wrong, it's that our equation is wrong. So we need to balance the equation. So here's that unbalanced equation, and here we are using pictures. So here's the methane, uh, four white hydrogens, one black carbon. Here's the carbon dioxide, one black carbon, two red oxygens, and here's water, two white hydrogens, one red oxygen. In order for this to combine with some oxygen and form CO2, we can see that. Well, take this carbon and an oxygen molecule, and you can make this. But then you have four hydrogens left over, and they have nothing to react with. Um, this is something where, you know, I give you permission, go to the store and buy some gumdrops or different colored candies and stick them together and make them and, and then take them apart and put them back together and see how you have to have four of these to work out with the correct number of hydrogens and carbons, okay? And then when you're finished, eat the candy. So for this to work, we have to have two oxygen molecules. That gives us a total of one carbon, four hydrogens, and four oxygens. And then when they combine, they make one CO2, and they make two molecules of water. And that gives us the same number of each atom, four, four hydrogens, one carbon, and four oxygens. That didn't come out of my mouth very well. Did it make any sense at all? Do you have any questions? It is really important to grasp this concept. Um, and this is the easiest place to do it. We've got pictures. We're taking this apart, we're taking these apart like building blocks, and we're putting them back together. You can't have any leftovers, and you can't pull any from your pocket or under the couch or anything. You can only use what you have. And the equation is adjusted to reflect this by putting these numbers in front of O2. We know that oxygen forms molecules with two atoms. We can't change the formula and say, oh, it must be O4. There is no O4. What it means is that we have two of those. And then we end up with two water molecules, not something that's you know H4O2 that doesn't exist. So we need to learn how to balance chemical equations. Uh, you should have done this before, but um, maybe it didn't quite make sense. So instructions, um, first write a skeletal equation. So you get the formulas for the reactants and the products and you get the arrow in there. Then you have to balance it. Um, these are suggestions. This is called balancing by inspection, which means balancing it by looking at it. Um, and there's no set of instructions that I can give you that will always be the best way to balance it. These are guidelines. Um, good idea to start with atoms that are in um, the more complex formulas first. Um, try to do those, the ones in compounds, before you do the pure elements. Um, balance anything that occurs as a free element, like the O2. Do those last, just because it's easier. It ends up being easier that way. Um, depending on how you feel about fractions, sometimes it's easy or easier to use some fractions as coefficients. Um, if you do that, then at the end you need to get rid of them because our coefficients should be whole numbers. And then check your work to make sure that um, everything's balanced. So we're going to do some examples. And we're going to get a little practice writing formulas as well. Write a balanced equation for the reaction between solid silicon dioxide and solid carbon to produce solid silicon carbide and carbon monoxide gas. That's right, I forgot, I hate this problem. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is write formulas for the reactants and the products. Um, and the words here give us clues about what are the reactants and what are the products. 
So it's between this and that. Those are the reactants to produce. That's the arrow. So the and is like a plus sign. And the to produce is where the arrow goes. And then we have another and, and that's a plus sign. So silicon dioxide, what's the formula? SiO2. Molecular compound, silicon dioxide. What is the state? Solid, liquid, gas, or aqueous? Solid. Solid. We know that because it says S. It's, I'm sorry. <laughs> solid. It says solid. Solid carbon. What's the formula for carbon? C. That's an element. Is it a diatomic element? No, it's not. So it's just the element symbol. And that's also a solid because it said it's solid. Solid silicon carbide. Okay. So I discussed this formula off, uh, off the record. This um, is a molecular compound. Um, they, they left the mono off the second element as well, and so I would expect that naming this one might be a little confusing. It is SIC. And what's the formula for carbon monoxide? CO. And the state for that one is gas. Okay, so those, that's the skeletal equation. It's the skeleton. Then we need to balance it. So balancing by inspection, um, the rules suggest that I maybe want to leave carbon for the end. So maybe want to do silicon or oxygen first. I guess so. I played these videos, um, videos from this school at another school when I had laryngitis, and they're like, what's with all the trains? <laughs> well, the classroom is right next to the train tracks. There it is. And I like fresh air, at least as fresh as we have around here. So let's look at the silicon. Let's, a lot of times, if you just start with the first element, it works out OK. So how many silicons are on the left side of the arrow? One. How many on the right side of the arrow? Cool. We're going really well so far. Let's try oxygen. How many oxygens on the left? And how many on the right? One. How can we fix that? We'll put a two in front of carbon monoxide. We can't change it into carbon dioxide. That would balance it, but then that's a different chemical reaction. So I'm going to put a two in front of it. So I've got two oxygens here, and I've got two oxygens over here. Did that mess up the silicon? No, didn't. Sometimes when you fix one thing, you mess something else up. So now all I've got left is the carbon. So I have one carbon on this side, and how many on this side? Three. This is why you want to leave elements for last, because I can put a three here to make three carbons on each side, and that is not going to affect anything else. If I had to put a three over here to balance silicon or something, then it would mess up the oxygens. So there's the balanced chemical equation. That was an easy one. Any questions? OK, um, balanced chemical equation for combustion of gaseous ethane, a minority component of natural gas in which it combines with gaseous oxygen to form gaseous carbon dioxide and gaseous water. So they gave us the formula of ethane because we haven't officially learned how to write that formula yet. And that's in the gas state. What's the other reactant here? O2. Oxygen. Oxygen is a diatomic element. When it's by itself, you have to write it as O2. That's a gas to form carbon dioxide, CO2, says it's in a gas state, and water in the gas state, H2O. So 
So I'm going to show you a different approach for um, balancing here. I mean, it's, it's overall the same idea, but it involves writing some stuff down. The last one was pretty easy. You can just kind of look at it and go one by one. Sometimes they get a little more involved, and so this method might work better for you. So I'm just going to draw a line where the arrow is, and then I'm going to list the different elements that I have down the left side. I've got carbon, I've got hydrogen, and I've got oxygen. And then I'm going to take inventory and see what I've got. So in this compound, I have two carbons and six hydrogens. So I'm going to put a two here and a six, and I have no oxygens. Over here, in oxygen, there's no carbon, no hydrogen, and there's two oxygen atoms. And in CO2, I have one carbon and two oxygens and no hydrogens. In the water, I've got no carbons, two hydrogens, and one oxygen. Then I'm just going to see what I've got. Um, I look over here for carbon. I've got a total of two. That's nothing. And over here, I've got one. So I need to put a coefficient in front of CO2 so that I can get two carbons. So that would be a two. When I put in that coefficient, it changes the number of carbons to two. It changes the number of oxygens to what? Four. Now I'm going to look at my hydrogens. So I, I got carbon straightened out. I'm going to look at hydrogens. I've got a total of six on the left side, and I've got two on the right side. How can I change a two into a six? Multiply by three. Multiply by 3, that changes the 2 to a 6, and it changes the 1 to a 3. It's not magic, it's just multiplying. Did I mess up the carbons? No, I did not. So now I've got carbon and hydrogen taken care of, now I'm going to take care of oxygen. So over here I have 4 oxygens and 3 oxygens, that's a total of 7. Over here, I've got 2. What do I multiply 2 by to get 7? 7 halves, or 3 and a half. So this is where fractions may come in. So if I put in a fraction, 7 halves, right? that would change this into a 7, and things would be balanced. Then before I'm actually finished, I need to go and clear all my fractions. So the denominator is 2. I'd need to multiply everything by 2. So those of you who are good with fractions, that was enough explanation. So some of you are not so good with fractions, and that's OK. Oops, I didn't want to go that far. So I've got oxygens coming in pairs, and I need seven of them. This is what I call the odd-even problem. You can't have pairs of things and get an odd number of stuff. So what we're going to do is we're just going to double everything because when you double an odd number, you get an even number. So I'm going to put a 2 here, and that's going to be 4 and 12, and that's still 0. And this is the one I'm messing around with, so I'm going to leave that alone. I'm going to change this 2 to a 4. That makes this a 4, and that makes this um, an 8. And I'm going to change my 3 to a 6, and that becomes a 12 and a 6. So I doubled everything except the oxygen, which is the one thing I was still working on. Now I need 8 plus 6 is 14. I need 14 oxygens. And I can multiply by 7 and get 14. I end up at the same place as if I did the fractions and then multiplied everything by 2. It's just that one method probably makes more sense to you than the other. Use the one that makes sense. And then you should always go through and double check. 
I've got two times two, I've got four carbons and four carbons, and I've got 14 oxygens, and I've got two times four is eight, and six is 14, and two times three is six. Two times six is 12, and 12, so I'm balanced. Make sure you don't overlook somebody. Any questions? Let's do another one. Write a balanced equation for the reaction between aqueous lead 2 nitrate and aqueous potassium chloride to form solid lead 2 chloride and aqueous potassium nitrate. Look, all those words, right? Well, these are ionic compounds. Lead 2 nitrate. To write the formula, we need to know what the ions are. So lead is Pb, and what does the Roman numeral 2 tell me? The charge. This is Pb2+. plus. What's the formula for nitrate? NO3 with a negative 1 charge. So I look at those charges, and I determine that I need two nitrates for every lead ion. You can do that by crisscrossing. The state here would be aqueous. And then I've got aqueous potassium chloride, also an ionic compound. What's the charge on potassium ion? Plus one, because it's in group one. And chloride has what charge? Minus one, because it's in group 7A. So that formula will be KCl, that's also aqueous. When I write these, I leave some space because I may need to put in coefficients. There's my arrow. Now I've got lead 2 chloride. Well, that's lead 2 again, Pb2 plus, and chloride is Cl minus. So that's going to be PbCl2, and that's not aqueous, that's a solid. And potassium nitrate is potassium ion and nitrate ion. And those charges are the same but opposite, so we just push those guys together, and it says that's aqueous. Okay, so those are the formulas. That's my skeleton. Any questions? When we balance this, notice that we have nitrate ions over here, and we have nitrate ions over here. In many chemical reactions, the, the polyatomic ion remains together. It's just swapping partners. So I still have NO3. I can balance the nitrogen and the oxygen separately. That will work. But I can also balance nitrate as a unit. So I'm not going to do all the tallies with this one. I'm just going to go through and look at it. So lead, I've got one PB here, and I've got one PB there. So that's OK. Here, how many nitrate ions do I have? I have two. I have parentheses and a two on the outside. I have two nitrate ions. How many nitrate ions on the right side? Just one. So I need to put a coefficient of two in front of the whole formula so that I can have two nitrate ions. Next is potassium. How many potassiums on the left side? One, and how many on the right? Two. Okay, so I need to put a two here as well. That didn't mess up the leads or the nitrates, so I'm okay. And now I'm going to look at chlorine. I have two chlorines here, and I have two chlorines there. It's not unusual for the last element to kind of take care of itself. Sometimes when you're balancing an equation, you, you start to feel like you're going around in circles and you're not going to get anywhere. Um, if this wasn't a 2 over here, maybe it was a 1 or a 3, then I'd have to change the coefficient here. That would mess up the lead, which would mess up the nitrates, which would mess up the potassium, and I'd just be changing and changing. Recognize that behavior as soon as you can and just stop. Double check your formulas. If I wrote this formula incorrectly, it could be impossible to balance the equation. So that's one reason you may go in circles. The other reason you may go in circles is you might have chosen your starting element badly. 
some formula, some equations are easier to balance if you start in a particular place. You can't necessarily predict that, but if you get started and you realize this isn't going well, my equation, my formulas are all correct, start over in a different place. Okay, maybe start with the chlorine instead of the lead. Start backwards or something. Any questions? <laughs>